All right, so today we begin a new series uh, called Runaway Believers. This will be an eight-week expository uh, series in the book of Jonah. And um, if you've read the book of Jonah, you know that it is a short book. Uh, it's only four chapters, and it reads like a story. It's a narrative. Um, if you grew up in a Christian home or uh, going to, to children's church, then you no doubt know this story because it's an easy way to talk about the way in which disobedience leads to God putting you on timeout, right? Um, but but I, would, I would submit to you that it's about so much more than that <clears throat> and that we could spend months and months just talking about the depths of this story, the many layers of meaning, um, and so much life application, things that we can apply right now to our lives for a story that happened so long ago, many centuries after this event took place. Um, as Aaron was saying, um, as a church, uh, we've spent this year building the hearth, right? That, that coming into 2024, we just felt like God was, uh, was telling us that we needed to steward uh, his presence, right? That we, that we needed to, to do that and it was vital and that we needed to be, be committed to becoming a greenhouse, right? That our, our hearts individually and our church communally must be a place where God can dwell richly. <clears throat> and so from there, we began to experience corporate encounter, right? We've had... Uh, two baptism services uh, this year. We baptized about 25 people, some of whom were giving their lives to Jesus as they came forward, um, others who were recommitting their lives to Jesus as they were getting baptized. Uh, you guys know, if you've been around, we took a group of guys to, to a mountain to hear the voice of God, um, and they were transformed. They've come back, and they still are walking in beautiful community. Um, but then beyond that, we are uh, hearing many stories um, in you guys' lives of marriages being restored, of bodies being healed, of miraculous provision uh, coming forward for you guys, God just showing up in that way. And so like, like we're, we're hearing so many stories that we, in our conversations, we've been like, we've got to bring back a regular rhythm of just having you guys come up and share your story with the community. We, we don't want to be the hype men, okay? <clears throat> Like Aaron and I, we can come up and tell your stories for you, but we want to create space for you guys to come up and just share with our community the things that's going on in your lives. Uh, and so, so with all, all God is doing in and among us, I believe this summer is a good time for us to really lean into our relationship with God. And this is what uh, Aaron and I have been uh, talking about a lot. And so when God comes to us as he came to Jonah, what can we learn about him? And what can we learn about ourselves so that we can better love him and each other in this world that God has called us to reach? Huh? So as you came in today, um, again, we've started this, this new uh, series, but what you're going to be able to get as you leave here, um, if you go to our, our website, therock.church, uh, you'll be able to find a PDF that'll give you what we wanna do is along with this sermon series, um, we figured this is just a, a good opportunity for us to study scripture together as a church, right? So we're committed for the next eight weeks to uh, basically go through the book of Jonah with you as we, we preach it. Uh, but it, I think it's also a good opportunity for us to study it together. And so on our website, therock.church, you'll be able to find a PDF that'll give you Bible study questions um, for you to be able to study it with us. And so if you're in a community group and you're looking for content to study this summer, here you go. Okay, this is good content that you can use uh, with your group. Um, if you're not in a community group, but you wanna be in one, this is a great opportunity for you to just gather some folks together and spend the next eight weeks with us just studying the book of Jonah. There's so much uh, for us to get out of this book together, amen? All right, so the plan is, is to, to make this something that you can do with the community, something you can do even with your family. And I would challenge those of you who have uh, children, this is a good uh, opportunity too for you to, as a family, just you know, pull your family aside and let's study uh, this book together. Um, on the, the website, you'll also get some resources for children. I think we have some, some stuff that they can draw on and, and uh, stuff that they can interact with as well, all right? And so who's, who's with us? Who's, who's up to studying this book this summer? And then, you ain't doing nothing else, all right? <laughs> all right, I don't know about you guys, but like, you know, my kids, you know, they're just in home. If they don't have their, their, their devices, man, it's like death. Our Wi-Fi went down for a little bit yesterday, and I thought one of, I thought one of my kids was going to die. Like, it was rough. All right. So, uh, yeah, so let's study this together. So last commercial, one, one more commercial. Am I okay with that? One more commercial. 
Okay, so I'm a 90s kid, right? Grew up in the 90s. You guys remember, for those of you guys who are around my age, do you guys remember when movies used to come out, there would always be soundtracks that came out with the movie? Remember that? Like, like a movie would come out, but before the movie came out, the soundtrack would come out, right? And so we created a soundtrack for this series, all right? All right, so if you have Spotify, um, you can scan the code. I think I, I included it. You can scan this code and you can get the playlist. We also, I created it in YouTube as well, so that I'll be posted uh, on our, uh, our YouTube account as well. We'll have that playlist together for you. But I very carefully and meticulously created a playlist. If you don't listen to it, it'll hurt my feelings. Okay? <laughs> I make my family listen to it a lot. <clears throat> All right, and so, no, I don't narrate in between. Maybe next year, <laughs> maybe next year. All right, so you can find that, again, if you uh, look for it, uh, Runaway Believers uh, on Spotify, scan the code. We'll also have that available on our YouTube. Um, I've done it there as well, all right? So let me, uh, let me just start, <clears throat> let me start by asking a question. Can you maybe throw my water? I'm not gonna make it today. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, let me start by asking a question. What is the book of Jonah about? Just think, rhetorical. Rhetorical. What is the book of Jonah about? Is it about race and nationalism? Is it about God's call to mission? Is the book of Jonah about the struggles believers have to obey and trust God? Now, now I believe it's all those things, but more specifically, I want to submit to you that the book of Jonah is about sin and grace. The book of Jonah is about sin and grace. Everyone say sin. sin. Everyone say grace. All right, good definition for sin is running away from God. And a good definition of grace, was that a baby tooting That's, or burping? We'll say burping. That was me. Oh. Uh, well, I tried to save you, Pastor Bob. All right, well, now to get back on track. <clears throat> Grace, grace, grace. <clears throat> so a good definition for sin is running away from God. And a good definition of grace is God's effort to pursue and intersect self-destructive behavior. See, the book of Jonah is about a man that runs away from God, and it's about the ways in which God pursues him. And what I really want you to get this whole summer as we look at this together is I want you to understand that we are all like Jonah. We we're all like Jonah. Uh, in my preparation for this, um, I read some Jonah commentaries, uh, in particular one by Philip Carey. Um, I read uh, a book by Tim Bowles, Mark Langham, and of course, because I, I've read almost everything Tim Keller has produced, uh, he has a book called Prodigal Prophet. It's probably one of my favorite resources. And he has also a, ser a series of sermons he preached in the 1990s. And I, I, I don't share that to brag, but I'm just indebted to these guys. So much of of what you guys are gonna hear as we look at this together. You know, they, they've just shaped a lot of how I think about this book. All right, so no matter who you are, you can relate to Jonah because the essence of sin is running from God. All right, the essence of sin is running from God. The first step of Christianity and of any relationship to God at all is to admit that you have run from God and that even now, to some degree, everybody in this room is running from God, right? It is in our nature to run from God, right? We see this in the first pages of the Bible in the first relationship between God and humanity. Adam and Eve sinned, and as soon as they sinned, they ran, they hid, right? We all have the same deep down inherent nature. We run, we hide, and if you don't see that, you don't know yourself. You don't know yourself. If you want a relationship with God, you must not primarily see yourself as a self-sufficient person. Or you can't be someone who says, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I pretty much have it together. I, I just need to add Jesus to my portfolio, right? I, like I just need to, to, to just get a working knowledge of Jesus. I need to know who I'm working with, right? I just need to add Jesus to buffer up a few areas of my life now. And you must not even see yourself as a hurting or suffering person. You are not a damsel in distress who Jesus has rescued and now you're just holding on tight to him. No, you're a fugitive, stowaway, Forrest Gump, 
you're running. Always. That's what we are. Right? You must see yourself primarily as a flight risk. You must be able to say, I have run from God, I am running from God, and until you know that, you'll never understand God's work in your life. We're running. See, the first step in knowing God personally is to know that you run from him. That's step A, 1A. Step 1B is that you also need to know how you run from him. Right? Every one of us have unique, habitual ways of running away from God, and until you know what your ways are, you can't really grow as a Christian. All right. And so the book of Jonah teaches us what it looks like to run from God and all that God does to remedy it. That's what this is about. All right, and so today and next week, I'm going to go uh, through Jonah chapter 1 with you. So we're going to look at that today and next week. Uh, we're only, we're only going to look at the first four verses of chapter 1 today. All right, so four verses I have for you. Right, there's so much, there's so much here. I hope I can do it justice. Right, I, um, I'm reading a commentary that devoted about a quarter of the book just to the first four verses. So I think it makes sense for us to just spend today looking at the very beginning of this book. Amen? And so this is how it starts. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All right, so looking at the first four verses of Jonah chapter 1, I just want us to see three things. We're going to look at this together today. Three things are Jonah is called to do something. Secondly, Jonah runs away from it. And third, God pursues him. All right, Jonah's called to do something. He runs, God pursues. That's what we're going to look at. All right, so first, Jonah's called to do something. Uh, the first person that we are introduced to in the book of Jonah is actually not Jonah. It's the Lord. All right, it starts by saying, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. All right. And so right away, we are introduced to the most important person in the book. All right, it's the word of the Lord that moves every event of the story forward. It's the word of the Lord that provokes Jonah's flight. It's the word of the Lord that provided a fish to swallow Jonah. And it's the word of the Lord that made the fish vomit him up on shore. It's the word of the Lord that gets Jonah to preach to the Ninevites. And it's the word of the Lord that argues with this distraught prophet as he gets upset about God saving Nineveh. And so in order for there to be any fellowship between God and humanity, the word of the Lord has to initiate it. All right. We see this in Genesis 1.1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered over the face of the deep as the Holy Spirit hovered over the deep. And then God said, let there be light. The Bible starts this way. It's then echoed. In the New Testament, when John says in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right? Nothing happens without the sovereign, ever-loving, initiating Word of the Lord in our lives. And without it, there would be no story, there would be no movement, there would be no tension, there would be no running, and there would be no rescue. It all starts with God. Right? Although this book is called Jonah, the God of the Bible, right? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Pastor Bob, as they say in Haiti, right? right? God is the star of the show. He's the most important person in this book, okay? So then who's Jonah? Who's Jonah? Jonah is one of the 12 minor prophets of the Bible and was a successor of the great northern prophets, Elijah and Elisha. Uh, Jonah lived during the reign of Jeroboam II and was a contemporary of Hosea and Amos. Uh, Jonah is the only Old Testament prophet on record that God sent to a heathen nation with the message of repentance, which makes the word of the Lord and his eventual obedience to it really surprising to people who knew him. Apart from the book of Jonah, the only reference to him is in 2 Kings 14, 
uh, Amos, which was one of his peers, who was a prophet as well, was very hostile towards King Jeroboam II. But Jonah seemed to be closely connected to the king. And so Jonah was very likely known as intensely patriotic, patriotic, excuse me, a highly partisan nationalist. He was probably someone who said something like, I will never preach to Nineveh. And as we all know, tell God your plans and watch him laugh, right? All right? Verse two says, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. All right, so who's Nineveh? Who's Nineveh? Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, uh, of Assyria which was the strongest in world power during Jonah's lifetime. Uh, Erica Blibetru, uh, in her research on Assyria, proclaimed that Assyrian history is as gory and blood curling a history as we know. All right, they were one of the cruelest and most violent empires of ancient times. Assyrian kings often recorded the results of their mil military victories gloating of whole plains littered with corpses and of cities burned completely to the ground. The Emperor Shalamanzer III is well known for depicting torture, dismembering, and decapitating his enemies. After capturing enemies, the Assyrians would typically cut off their legs in one arm, leaving the other arm in hand so that they could shake the victim's hand in mockery as he was dying. They forced friends and family members uh, to parade with the decapitated heads of their loved ones ele elevated on poles. They pulled out prisoners' tongues and stretched their bodies with ropes so that they could be filleted alive while their skins were displayed on city walls. They burned adolescents alive, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, right? They were ISIS before ISIS, right? They were, they were Jonah's generations, Hamas and Hezbollah, all right? This is who God is telling Jonah to go preach to. Heck no. <laughs> Go preach to them. All right, so Jonah is called to do something, but secondly, let's see how he responds. All right, verse three says, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. All right, so God tells Jonah to go and do the unthinkable. All right, God is telling a preacher to go to the biggest, baddest, meanest, most powerful city in the world and tell everybody to repent and turn to God, right? It's an unreasonable and irrational thing to be asked to do, right? I mean, imagine going to Gaza right now, all right? Going to Gaza and going into the terror tunnels and finding the exact location of Yahya Sinwar and telling him and his men to repent. Imagine going to Russia right now and finding the headquarters of Putin and telling him that if you don't turn to God right now, God's gonna take you out. How do you think that'll go? I'll wait. All right, at best you'll be made fun of, you'll be insulted, you'll be incarcerated. At worst, they will strike you down where you stand, All right? That's could happen. So God told Jonah to go to Nineveh with no explanation. Think about this. What we have to do when we read scripture is the vantage point we get as readers is we know the beginning from the end, right? So we know how Jonah's story ends. And so it's hard to get into the, the head of people as they're experiencing something. God tells Jonah with no explanation, I want you to go to this, this country. I want you to preach to these people. So what does he do? He disobeys. Why does he disobey? Why do you disobey? Right? This goes all the way back to the garden, right? Adam and Eve were also given a directive with no explanation. Do not eat from this tree. That was it. Do not eat or you'll die. No explanation. But because they couldn't think of a good reason for this command of God, and this is how we normally work, when God gives us a directive, because we can't think of a reason why he's asking us to do this, we think then, oh, well, there is no reason, and so we disobey. That's what Adam and Eve did. That's what Jonah did. That's what we do. 
right? God could not be trusted to have their best interests at heart, so they ate. Jonah couldn't think of a good reason why God would ask him to do this, so he took refuge in his own wisdom and feelings and said, no way, Yahweh, and ran. All right. Jonah takes a boat in the opposite direction. In chapter four, we're going to learn why he did this. He did this because he didn't want to do, have anything to do with these pagans. He wanted nothing to do with these people, which is to say this, and this is interesting. Jonah was not afraid of failure. He was afraid of success. Think about that. Like, I, I wouldn't go into a terror tunnel in Gaza because I know those brothers are crazy, okay? They will take me out, right? Jonah's like in his head, I'm not going because the very act of me being sent to preach a message of repentance means there is a chance they could repent and I'm out. I don't want no part of that. And so we see that the root of Jonah's disobedience is self-righteousness, right? Now Jonah's not unlike us. He's not unlike us. We all have ways of patching up our own righteousness and feeling superior to people, don't we? Jonah's particular form of self-righteousness is racism, but there are many other ways to be self-righteous. There are many ways to be self-righteous. So this moment reveals that pride has blocked Jonah's own understanding of the grace of God in his life. And therefore, it made it impossible for him to feel any compassion for these people. This is what self-righteousness does. It blinds you to others. And so Jonah was not in a position, listen to this, this is good. Jonah was not in a position to preach about sin and grace to these people because he was a stranger to it himself. See, this is the gospel. The gospel is this. We all have completely fallen away from God, and it's only by the mercy of God that we can be lifted up into his family and welcomed into his presence by free grace. All right. And so to the degree that we know that, we cannot feel superior to anyone else. All right. See, a Christian is a person that is both rich and poor at the same time. Hear me on this. A Christian is someone who's both rich and poor at the same time. I always say it this way. We are like spiritual billionaires. That's what a Christian is. We are spiritual billionaires. The inheritance really is ours, right? It's part of our net worth, but at the same time, it's a free gift, so we can't feel superior to people walking around without it. And sadly, as in Jonah's case, if you don't understand this free grace God is offering you, and let me say it this way, you'll know that you don't understand the grace of God in your life when you're still selfish, when you're still stingy, when you're still walking around like a person in poverty. That's how you'll know, right? You can't bless those who curse you. You can't love those who hate you. You can't forgive those that offend you. I mean, take an inventory right now. How are you doing on those things? You, you can't trust in God's provision, so you're always holding on tightly to your stuff. Right? You have a, a very present father that loves you and cares for you, but you live like an orphan. Another thing I want us to see in this verse is that not only did Jonah run, right, but he went down to Joppa, it says. And I think it's intentional about that. He went down to Joppa. He paid the fare and he went down into the ship, which is to say this, that disobedient, disobedience is always a downward descent. Uh, yeah. Disobedience is always a downward descent. Jonah went to look for a ship and there was one to take him. And here's a lesson, guys. The lesson is this. If you want to flee from God, there will always be a ship to take you. If you want to flee from God, there will always be a ship. Have you guys just had those friends in your life that are just no good? <laughs> they're like the demon on the shoulder, right? Like they're always trying to talk you into the stuff that you know you shouldn't do. And if you are that friend, we're going to do an altar call soon. <laughs> We'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. Um, 
so I, I love how uh, Keller explained this. He said, if you harbor impure thoughts, eventually there'll be a bed to lie in. If you harbor resentful thoughts, there will eventually be a stone to throw or a knife to stab with. If you harbor jealousy and envy, eventually there'll be an opportunity to embezzle and steal. Right? There's always a ship ready to take you to Tarshish, and it always has room for you. And so Jonah is called to do something. He hears the word of the Lord. No explanation. It's the worst idea in the world. And secondly, he responds by running in the opposite direction. And he finds a ship that will take him far away from where he's supposed to go. And now it's smooth sailing. Okay, so Tarshish is like modern day Spain. And for them at that time, that was like the end of the world. They didn't know if there was anything on the other side of that. All right. And so he went that way where Nineveh is like close to Baghdad. It's like near um, Iran, Iraq, that area. I mean, he went the exact opposite direction, right? And so he finds a ship. It takes him far away and he's, that he's supposed to go. And now it's smooth sailing. And so disobedience to God often seems easier than obedience, especially when you think you're smarter than he is. We would never say that out loud. We would never say that out loud. But we act that out all the time. God tells us to do something, we're like, nah, that's, that's definitely not you. <laughs> All right. And so lastly, verse 4 tells us God's response. All right. It says this. It says, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All right. And so if sin is running away from God, like I said to you guys earlier, grace is God chasing us down in love and intercepting our self-destructive behavior. And so Jonah gets on this boat, it sets sail, and he thinks he's in the clear, but then all of a sudden he hears this sound. That's, that's not it. <laughs> Oh gosh, okay, well, if Jonah refuses to go into a great city, he will go into a great storm, all right? So let me tell you the bad news and the good news on this, all right? The bad news is that whenever you sin, there is a storm cloud attached and it will catch up to you. Let me say it again. Whenever you sin, there is a storm cloud attached and it will catch up to you. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. It says the wages of sin is death, which is to say that if you sin, at some point, the bill will come due. Sin sets up strains and fractures in our lives that leads to breakdown. And so here's the deal. The laws of God bite back. If you break them, they break you. This is how it works. All right. If we sin against God, if we sin against our bodies, if we sin against our relationships, there are consequences, storms that come into our lives, all right? And so this is not to say that every difficult thing that comes into your life is a punishment for sin, right? The, the Bible says, uh, does not say that every difficulty is a result of sin, but it does teach that every sin will bring you into difficulty. Do you understand that? Yes. Not every difficulty is, is the result of your sin. So if you're going through hard times, it's not always because you've done something. But if, you, if you've disobeyed God, look for the storm. Okay, it's coming. All right. Now think, think with me. All right, let's make this personal for a second. Let's make it personal. What is it in your life right now that you are doing that you know you shouldn't do, but because you can't think of a way that it's harming anyone else or yourself, you keep doing it? The next question is, is it raining? Are there storms? in your life? Are you in a storm right now? Now, if not, it's totally understandable, by the way, right? Disobedience doesn't always have an immediate bad effect, right? Because as we read further along, what you'll find out is that Jonah was asleep in this boat as it was sinking, All right? And so if you're not in a storm right now, please don't think to yourself, oh, I'm getting away with this. Initially, sexual immorality feels good, but 
uh, initially the first you know, rush, the, the first high feels good, right? Initially, harboring resentful thoughts feels good, but eventually you're in a prison. And, and it is hell once you realize that the thing you thought you were in control of actually controls you. See, disobedience has a, a storm attached to it, but here's the good news, all right? Here's the good news. In the middle of the storm, there is loving intention. That's the good news, that, that God sends a big fish, that God uses storms as a means of intervention. And so if you're in a storm right now, would you consider that it may be God trying to extend mercy to you? It, it may be God trying to wake you up to the fact that you're running from him as counterproductive. Right. And so look around and you'll see that there's provision in the storm. I mean, God has so rigged this life for his children that when storms come into our lives, we actually have a promise in Romans 8.28 that says that he will use them for good. All right. I mean, think about our heroes in the faith. All right. Think about a man named Abraham. We all know him. All right. He's known as a great man of faith and the father of the faithful. But he lived through many years of silence, many years of wandering in the wilderness around with uh, unfulfilled promises. Think of Joseph, right? Joseph knew early that he was going to save his people, but in order to root out his, his arrogance and privilege, he lived through many years of slavery and imprisonment. And because he lived through that, the doors of salvation opened for his people, All right? Think of Moses. Right. Moses became a fugitive and, and had to spend 40 years in the wilderness before he became one of the most important figures in the Bible. And so I'm here to tell you that difficulty may come in your life. And for these guys, if you read their story, you know some of their difficulty was their sin, but some of their dif difficulty was God's intervention in their lives. Right. And so if we respond well, every storm, every difficulty can wake us up to truths that we would otherwise never see and reduce the power of sin over our hearts. Amen. All right. If Jonah would have continued to run, the storm would have drowned him, but he has himself thrown out of the ship and into the middle of it. All right. And so this was his way of beginning to repent and trust God, and by hurling himself to the, into the storm, it was the very means of his salvation. It was the way that he was saved. Amen. Let's stand together. This is what happens when you only preach four verses, right? <laughs> Listen, if you're here today and you know you've been running from God and, and that running has caused a storm in your life, I want you to know that there's love under the waves. There's love under the waves. The only way that the storm can drown you is if you keep running from it. It's the only way, All right? See, some of you are running from God and here's how you can stop. Let me tell you how you can stop. Turn around and see that there is no refuge from God. There's only refuge in God, All right? There's no refuge from God. There's only refuge in him. Right? And the only way to turn to God is to go to him through Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, man, for, for a prophet like Jonah, whose story is so short and so bizarre, uh, for a man whose story is tucked deeply into the Old Testament and doesn't even really move the narrative of the Bible forward, it's really interesting to note that Jesus references Jonah by name in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is talking and he says this. He says, as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so will the son of man be to this generation. And then he says, behold, one greater than Jonah is here. Right. And Jesus can say this because although Jonah, through his disobedience, found himself in a storm and was thrown in to save a ship full of people, Jesus, through his obedience, found himself in a storm and was thrown into it to save a world full of people. All right. And so it doesn't matter what the storm is that's raging in your soul. Jesus Christ will calm the storm. He will calm the storm.
Listen, God has more grace to give you than you have sins to commit. Stop running. Renounce the self-righteousness in your heart that tells you that you have it all together and that you don't need the help. Amen. Amen. Maybe you're here today and you say, Sean, I'm a believer. I'm a believer, but I'm a stranger to grace. I'm, I'm in poverty. I, I, I need this love underneath the waves that you're talking about. I need the mercy of God. Jonah was a believer. So I would say this series is as much for the believers as it is for people who don't know Jesus. So Jonah was called to do something. Jonah responds by running. And God pursues him. This is a story of all of us. And if you're here today, and you would say, Sean, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but I do recognize that, yeah, he, he has called me. And I recognize that, yeah, I have been running. Hopefully today you recognize the third part, that God has been pursuing you. And maybe you're here, you don't even know why you came to church today. You had a friend drag you here against your will. Maybe you just wanted to get out of the sun. I don't know. Yeah. You know, the, the, so the, the cool kids have this thing that they call, they call shipping. Have you heard of this? Shipping. Now, I had to look this up, you know, because I'm middle-aged now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but listen, definition of shipping. You got you to gotta know this. If you want to connect with Gen Z, all right. And this actually happened at their school. I, I guess some kids started a social media, I think an Instagram account, and they started taking pictures of their classmates and trying to put them together, right? And so this is the definition of what shipping is, because some of you guys are looking at me crazy. All right. <laughs> shipping is the act of creating a romantic pairing between two people or characters who are not otherwise romantically linked. Now, I just want to say this to you. I am here to ship you today. Okay, because if you don't know who Jesus is, and if you don't understand his pursuit of you, if you don't understand what he came to do for you, that he is a greater Jonah because he was thrown into the waves. He was thrown into the wrath of God to save you. Man, your life is a, sh a, a sinking ship. I have to be careful how I, like, I got to pronounce that. <laughs> But it is, your life is a sinking ship. It's going down for real. Jesus can calm the storm though. Will you come to him? With all heads bowed, all eyes closed. I won't be much longer. If you're here and you would say, Sean, this resonates. I, I know I need Jesus and I'm tired of running. Just raise your hand. We just want to pray for you. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? His hands all over. My God. Anyone else? It's my last call. You're here and you know you need to give your life to Jesus. Listen, you can ill afford to continue to wait. Don't wait until the, until the shipwreck happens. Amen. Uh, you're here and you are a believer. You've been walking for, with Jesus for a while, but you know, man, Sean, I, I, I've been running. I know that God has called me to greatness. I know God has called me to walk with him. But in my own wisdom and thinking that I have it all figured out, I've been walking in disobedience and storms have come into my life. But today I want to give my life back to Jesus today. This is a call for you as well. Are you here? Raise your hand. Amen. 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 Lord, I just, right now I submit this amazing body to you. 
God, I thank you that you are so good and you are so sovereign that you know the intimate details of every life, of every hand that was raised. God, you know exactly what's going on. So God, I pray that you would meet each person right where they are and begin to show them their way home. God, I thank you that though in sin we run away from you, by your grace, you are so committed to intercepting our self-destructive behavior. We are runners, but thank you, God, that you chase us down. For those who for the first time are raising their hand and saying yes to you, Jesus, I pray that right now you would come into their lives, that you would fill their hearts, that you would see their heart of repentance, and that by your spirit, you begin to testify with them that you are theirs and they are yours. And for those of us who know you, God, but we've just been running away, God, would you forgive us? Would you heal us? Would you show us the way back to you as well, God? And we thank you for all you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen.